Father, it's our heart's delight to praise you in words like glory, glory. We have no other king but Jesus, Lord of all. Father, I pray as your word is proclaimed this morning as we consider it, I pray that the anthem is raised above all that you are reigning, that you're supreme. O oh, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you that you have given us a kingdom that cannot be shaken, nor will it fade or rust but it will endure with you on your throne forever and ever and ever. God, help us to feel the weight of such things as we consider this text this morning. I pray in Christ's name, amen. Please turn in your copy of God's perfect and holy word to Daniel chapter two, beginning in verse one. I have a question for you as we start this morning. What did you dream last night? Do you remember? If it's disturbing enough, you may be tempted to think, maybe God's trying to tell me something. If you have it two times in a row, you really start to think maybe he's trying to tell you something. We know from Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, let me put your mind to ease, that God doesn't speak to his people in dreams any longer. Hebrews 1 says, long ago at many times and in many ways, including dreams, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. But there was a time when God spoke to his people in dreams. And today's text is one of those times. Last week in chapter 1, God gave his people into Babylon's hands. God gave Daniel favor in the sight of the guards. And God gave Daniel exactly what he needed as he stood before this pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar. And today in chapter 2, we're going to see God give something else. This time, it is to King Nebuchadnezzar himself. God is going to give him a dream a dream that will disturb him so deeply that it will lead him into an encounter with the one true God. Look with me in Daniel chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the, the Chaldeans, the word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you, know, if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time to him and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show its interpretation. Verse 8, the king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time because you see that my, the word from me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, there is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no, no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Verse 12. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out. And the wise men were about to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. 
Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Verse 20, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. His, he gives wisdom to the wise he, and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. And he knows what's in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might and have, no, and have now made known to me what we ask of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Therefore Daniel went in to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went in and said thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king and I will show the king's interpretation. Verse 25, then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen in its interpretation? Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this, and he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than in all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the king and that you may, have the known, that you may know the thoughts of your mind. Verse 31. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image, this image mighty and exceedingly brightness, stood before you and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them off so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Verse 36 this was the dream, now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he has given, wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, making you rule over all. You are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom strong as iron because iron breaks into pieces and shatters all things and like iron that crushes it shall break and crush all these and as you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly iron it shall be a divided kingdom but some of the firmness of iron shall be in it just as you saw iron mixed with soft clay and as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle and you saw the iron mixed with soft clay so that they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all, it shall break in pieces all kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever, just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand." 
that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and paid homage to Daniel and has commanded that an offering and incense be offered to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. For you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over all the province of Babylon and chief prefect over the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request of the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. My, oh my, what a long story. We've got a lot of ground to cover. But it's a story that can be covered in three parts. First, there is an impossible situation. Second, we see a powerful God. And third, we see a hopeful future. An impossible situation, a powerful God, and a hopeful future. First, consider the impossible situation. Our story starts with King Nebuchadnezzar. He's briefly mentioned in chapter 1 last week, but this is the first time that we actually see him in action, getting to know him. He's the most powerful man on the planet at this point. He's conquered nations. He snuffed out any threats. He's a dictator. He is rich. He is powerful. He does whatever he wants to do. But he's also a disturbed man. What we'll see over the next few chapters with Nebuchadnezzar is this. He is paranoid. He is insecure. He's an irrational king. And chapter 2 gives us our first taste of that with him as he has experienced this dream and it is disturbing his mind. And what we're going to see in these verses is that the dream is from God. He has a message for this king and he doesn't go through royal channels. He doesn't set up an appointment. He doesn't inquire humbly. Everyone else may fear Nebuchadnezzar, but God does not. He barges into his room. He interrupts his sleep and the sovereign Lord of the universe delivers a message directly to the king's mind. And the, and the dreams disturb him. So what does he do? Verse 2, he calls in all of his best people, the enchanters, the magicians, his sorcerers, to come in to interpret the dream for him. He turns to all the resources at his fingertips. Whatever that can bring peace to his mind, he is grasping for. He brings them in to tell them, tell him the interpretation. Now something unusual happens at verse 4. For the majority of the time when you read your English Bible, you can do so without any thought to the original language that the Bible's written in, Hebrew and Greek. We have many scholars who have helped us in our English translations read without knowing the original language. But in verse 4 of chapter 2, something unique happens in the original language that doesn't come cl clear just in the English. This is where a good study Bible comes in hand to help us English speakers point out these things. 99% of the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, the common language of God's people. However, the international language of that day was Aramaic. In Daniel, we have this unique shift that takes place. In chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 3, it's written in Hebrew, the language of God's people. But at verse 4 of chapter 2, the language shifts from Hebrew to Aramaic, the international language of the world. Here's why I believe that matters. God doesn't simply want his people to see him as supreme and sovereign. God wants the world to see him as supreme and sovereign. This continues in Aramaic, the international language of the world, all, through, all the way through the end of chapter 7 before it switches back to Hebrew in chapter 8. God will not settle for his people alone seeing him as supreme and sovereign. This would be like if I was showing two or three of you something on my phone and I was showing you all a, a video or an article, something I was showing you and I'd say, wait a minute, this is too good just for two, of you, two or three of you to see. I need to put this on the big screen so that everybody can see it. This is what God's doing. We're getting into the heart of this story with Nebuchadnezzar 
And it's like it's put on pause and says, wait a minute, let's switch and let's broadcast this to the entire world. God's people are in Babylon. God is about to have a battle with the gods of the nations and he wants the whole world to see it. So these people are brought in to interpret the king's dreams. We see the response of the Chaldeans in verses 4 through 9. When they're brought in, they say, they, they start off well. They say, oh king, live forever. We will gladly interpret your dream for you. Whatever you want, we are at we are at your service, King Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, mighty one, just, just tell us your dream. It will be our pleasure to tell, us, to tell you the interpretation. And as here we see King Nebuchadnezzar's paranoia on display. He doesn't even trust those closest to him. He puts an extreme standard in place. He says, not only must you tell me what the dream means, you must also tell me what the dream was. How unreasonable is that? The king here is used to getting whatever he wants whenever he wants it. He doesn't care that this is unreasonable. I mean, do your job. That's why I have you in my court. You're in the king's court to do a job. I'm asking you to do your job. Do your job. If you can't do your job, I'll burn your houses. I'll tear you limb from limb. How desperate is that? So verse 7, they try to reason again. They say, calm down. We can tell you what your dream means. Let's work together here. Just tell us what your dream was and we'll tell you. We'll tell you what it means. Nebuchadnezzar isn't having it. We see in our text, he, in verse 8, he's tired of waiting. He says, I know that you're just trying to buy yourself more time. He says, no, you tell me the dream, you tell me the interpretation of it, or you're going to die. Do you want to die? Tell me the dream. And look how they respond in verse 10 and 11. Chaldeans answered the king and said, there's not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no king, no great and powerful king has ever asked such a thing of any magician, enchanter, or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult. No one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. They say, King Nebuchadnezzar, we, we want to work with you. We want to give you what you're wanting. And they pull some Dr. Phil on him and say, help us help you. And here we see the impossible situation that they're in. And they give him five reasons, in fact, in verses 10 and 11, why his request is impossible. This is unreasonable. First, they say, there is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. Say, we want to serve you, but listen, there's no man that ex exists that can do what you're asking. Second, they say, no great and powerful king has ever asked such a thing of any counselor. They're saying, what you're asking, King Nebuchadnezzar, it's it's unprecedented. It, it, it's, no great king has ever asked this. Don't you want to be like the powerful kings of history? They haven't asked this. Third, in 10 and 11, they say, this thing that the king asks is difficult. They say, look, fundamentally, this is too hard. Your request is not doable. It's just too difficult. They go further. Fourth, they say, no one can show the king, show it to the king except the gods. King Nebuchadnezzar, what you're asking us to do, no mere man can do it. Only the gods can do this, which brings them to their fourth reason why it's unreasonable. Only the gods can do this, which is a problem because the gods don't interact with us. They don't dwell with us. We have no dealing with them. You sense the scenario being set up. These counselors are showing why this request is un impossible to meet. They are clear. No man exists that can do this. No king has ever asked this. It's fundamentally not doable. Only the gods can do it, and they're nowhere around. What do you want us to do? They're painting this vivid picture of why it's so impossible. Now, hopefully, in the back of your mind, when you hear them say... No man exists, can do this. Hopefully you're thinking, what about Daniel? 
haven't heard of him yet in this story. And then hopefully when you hear, no king has ever asked this. This isn't doable. Maybe you're thinking, is that a challenge? Or when you hear them say, only the gods could do it, King Nebuchadnezzar. What about the God? I mean, we haven't heard of Yahweh yet in this text. And when you hear them say, the gods, they don't dwell with man. <laughs> what about Daniel's God? The impossible scenario that the king presents, it's set up to show that there is a God who overcomes the impossible. It sounds like a challenge. God doesn't lose challenges. Chapter 1 was the battle of the diets, you remember. God won. Chapter 2 is the battle of who can reveal this mystery. They say only the gods can do it, but only one does. The king's not listening to their concerns, though. He doesn't care that it's impossible. That's not his problem. It's theirs. And so his unreasonableness continues in verse 12 and 13. He says, you can't tell me the dream. Fine, I'll just kill all the wise men in, in Babylon. Drastic, to say the least. And there he is. Verse 14, 13. Daniel, part of the group that's going to be killed in this wide massacre. And notice Daniel's response in verse 15. Why is the decree so urgent? He responds the opposite way of King Nebuchadnezzar. The king was so disturbed... And what did he do? He jumped frantically to all of his resources. Daniel is about to be killed, and what does he do? He calmly asks questions. We would do well to learn from Daniel's response here. When something comes up that's unfair, something comes upon us that's unjust, we don't like it, it's not our preference, we're mistreated. We're kicked while we're down. How quickly we jump to confrontation, accusation, blame shifting, name calling, irrational judgments. It's easy to get there. We have bosses that are unreasonable and professors that are unreasonable. Teachers and figure, authority figures who are unreasonable. It's easy to jump straight whatever's going to save me. May the Lord increase in us all the ability to take a breath, gather the facts, and respond with controlled wisdom, trusting the Lord. And then in verse 16, Daniel shows this extraordinary measure of faith. He sets up a time with the king to interpret his dream before he even knows what the dream is. He doesn't know what the dream is any more than the other counselors do. He knows that it's never been done. He knows of the impossibilities like the others do. He knows that he cannot do it. He shares all of this knowledge with the other counselors, but he knows one thing they don't. He knows God can. And so he sets up an appointment with the king in faith, with his life hanging in the balance. And he has one night to prepare. What does he do? Verse 17, he, he goes home and he tells his friends. And the rest of the night, they don't spend hours strategizing about how they're going to answer the king. They don't come up with ideas about how they can distract the king or proposals about preserving their lives or write out requests about, please extend our deadline. They don't do any of that. What do they do? Verse 18, and Daniel told his friends to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. Daniel's God is so near compared to the other false gods who don't dwell with flesh. Daniel's God is so near that in his most desperate of hours, when death is awaiting him tomorrow morning, the first thing Daniel does is to go before God and plead for mercy. This is Daniel exemplifying prayerful dependence. Where do you go in your most desperate of hours when things seem impossible? 
Do you, like Nebuchadnezzar, run to your resources? I'll just buy my way out of this. Do you run to your friends? Oh, they'll just make me feel better. Do you run to alcohol or sex or pornography, materialism, sports, work, all these things? I'll just, I'll just do this because it's going gonna, it's gonna to take my mind off of this thing that's burdens me so badly. Or do you run to God in prayerful dependence, pleading for mercy? Listen, in life, you will run to what you think is most able to meet your need. Nebuchadnezzar had this dream disturbing him, and what does he do? I have people for that. Bring them in. Whatever you run to in your most desperate, stressed, burdened hour, you're banking on that to meet a need for you that only God can meet. Everything else will leave you lacking. Everything else will have you going deeper and deeper into guilt and regret. It may distract you for a moment, but it will damn you for eternity. Only God can satisfy your soul and only God can meet your ultimate need. Daniel found himself in an impossible situation, but not impossible for God. Impossible situations are meant to introduce a powerful God. What situation are you in right now? And it has you burdened and it has you stressed. Friends, could it be that God has you in that very situation so that his power is put on display in your life? So that the only explanation for your deliverance is God. Impossible situations provide the spotlight that highlights the power of God. Spend all your night begging for mercy. This leads us to the second part of our story. First was the impossible situation. Second, consider a powerful God introduced to verse 19. Daniel's pleading with God, verse 19. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Well, that was easy. Daniel prayed, demonstrated prayerful dependence. So if you don't act, God, tomorrow morning, I'm going to stand before the king. If you don't show up, he's going to chop my head off. You got to act. If you don't act, I'm literally dead meat. And God acts. The text shows the God of heaven acted, not to be confused with the false gods who have no dealings with man. Only one God acting here, only one God able. Now you may look at that and you say, I wish it were that easy to spend one night in prayer and to have God answer me in a dream. Even if it's a weird dream, I'll take it. Just give me a clear answer. Give me what I want. This text is not teaching that if you pray hard enough or in the right way that you'll always be saved like Daniel. This text is not guaranteeing that the outcome of our praying will always end like we want. The outcome of our praying will, however, end how God wants. And here in this story, it was God's will to save Daniel and to provide for him in this way. But God does not always act in the way that we expect or that we want just because we pray. This is why we pray for God's will to be done above ours because we know that he knows better than we do. This is one of the hardest aspects of the Christian life. Only one that's developed over years of spending time with the Lord, developed in maturity. Are we only willing to recognize God as the Lord of our lives until he doesn't answer our prayers in the ways that we want him to? What are you pleading with God right now? Saying, please, God, act. Please, just do it. Please, show up. And he hasn't yet. The fundamental plea resting underneath all your other pleas before God must be first, not your will, not my will, but yours be done. This is prayerful dependence. 
being content and satisfied in God's will being done, even if it's not what you were wanting or expecting. After God reveals the dream to Daniel, Daniel burst into praise. Verse 20 through 23, we have Daniel's description of God and his work. And right in the middle of that polytheistic society where they have a God for everything, Daniel describes the one true God being over it all. Once again, God's provided. Round one goes to God last week. Round two goes to God as well. So now the time comes. Daniel must stand before the king, tell him his dream, the interpretation of it. Look at verse 26. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? The king is waiting for his response. And he gives him his response in verse 27. Daniel answers just like the other enchanters. No wise man, enchanters, magicians, astrologers can show the king the mystery that the king has asked. Daniel says what they said. This is impossible. And you can imagine just when Nebuchadnezzar was going to respond in fury, Daniel says in verse 28, but, that's a beautiful word throughout all the scripture. This is impossible, verse 28, but there is a God in heaven, one God who reveals mysteries. Just imagine the gravity of this scene. Daniel is standing before the most powerful man in all the world. He can kill him whenever he wants. He is irrational. He can be set off very easily. And he has demanded, tell me the dream. And Daniel says, I can't. But there's a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He doesn't respect Daniel's God. Wouldn't it be tempting to just share the dream and get out of there as quickly as possible? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how you know it. Just share it and get out of there, Daniel, right? And Daniel knows that there's something more important than just sharing a dream. Daniel knows that there's something more important than just saving his own skin. And I wonder if we know it. Daniel knows that his priority in life is not to save his life or even to interpret a dream. Daniel's priority in life is to proclaim the excellency of God. So he does. He knows King Nebuchadnezzar needs to know the one true God. Daniel says, this is not about me. Let me introduce you to my God. And where are the other enchanters? Where are the other gods? Remember, they said it couldn't be done. The deities, they don't interact with man. This is too difficult. This is impossible. And with the whole world watching, Daniel says, we can't do it, but there is a God who can. Amen. This impossible situation has been overcome by one God, only one, and it's Daniel's God. Years later, I wonder if stories like this one came into the mind of Jesus when he said things like in Matthew 19, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So now in verse 28, Daniel tells the, tells the king that the dream he has had is pointing to future events. The text says these things will be in the latter days. It's pointing to days beyond Nebuchadnezzar, which brings us to our final point, a hopeful future. So we have this impossible situation, a powerful God shows up, and now we see a hopeful future. Verses 31 through 35, get, this is where it gets a little weird in Daniel. Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar what the dream actually was. See, the king saw this huge image in his dream. The head was gold, the chest and arms were silver, this image had a, a torso and thighs of bronze and its legs and feet were a mixture of iron and clay. And as the king is looking at this, this image, a stone comes and it hits the feet of this image, causing this image to crumble. And the dream ends with this stone growing into a, mass, a massive mountain that fills the whole earth. The dream paints an elaborate image of the world's finest elements being destroyed by a lowly stone. That's his dream. 
And now Daniel does the second half of his job. Verse 36 through 45, Daniel gives the more important piece. What does the dream mean? Each metallic element in this image represents a world kingdom that's going to rise to power. The head of gold represents Babylon. This is the current kingdom. Daniel makes that clear in verse 37 and 38. Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar are ruling as a head of gold, but only because God has currently given them the authority to do so. But Daniel says that other kingdoms will come after Babylon. And we're going to Excuse me, we're going to see these identities of these kingdoms later in Daniel in the coming chapters, so come back for that. But for today, God makes clear to this pagan king that Babylon's power will not reign forever, nor will Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom reign forever, nor will any other nation's power reign forever. In due time, each world power each world kingdom will have its time of authority, but ultimately each kingdom will fall. The gold's taken over by the silver, silver taken over by the bronze, iron and clay taken over by the stone. There's one last part we must interpret. We see the various elements represented, various kingdoms of the world, starting with Babylon. But what does the stone represent? We see the stone come, destroys the kingdoms, and then it balloons into this huge mountain. What could that possibly be? Verse 44 and 45 of this text tells us that the stone represents the kingdom that God's going to establish. God's point to Nebuchadnezzar is this, all the world kingdoms will have their moments of authority, but there's coming a day when God will destroy them all and establish his own kingdom. And God's kingdom will be unlike any other kingdom. God's kingdom will not be defeated, it will not crumble, it will not be broken into pieces. Rather, it will be a kingdom of no end. Revelation eleven fifteen, the partner book of Daniel in the New Testament makes this clear. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. The dream that was meant to humble Nebuchadnezzar, no matter how great you think you are, your kingdom has a deadline. This dream offers a hopeful future for Daniel and the rest of God's people in that time. I mean, they're in foreign Babylon. They're in captivity. The land is no more. Neither is their temple. And they may look around and think, has God abandoned us? Where is he? When is he going to show up? Will he show up? And what the dream offers to Daniel and to the rest of the world is God isn't finished with his people. There's a remnant. The kingdoms of the world will only rule for a time. And only because God has given them that authority. What encourages Daniel is, with, is the truth that one day we're going home and God will reign supreme. There's one last part to this text. And it's this question. When will God establish this kingdom? If you miss what I'm about to say, you're going to miss the whole purpose of Daniel 2. This is not a tag on at the end. I've had to say everything I've said up to this point in order to say this. The story has included all these elements so that we would see this next part. I wonder if we've been, as we've been going through this text, if Jesus has been in your mind any. Anything in the text that's reminded you or pointed you to him and been a shadow of him. Daniel 2 is a preview of New Testament times. Daniel 2 is one of the most Christ-centered chapters in all of the Old Testament. Daniel 2 doesn't make sense without the person of Jesus Christ. So don't check out. Get this key that unlocks this chapter. Let me show you what I mean. I wish I could point. There, there's so many here, but I'll just show you two. Where we see Jesus Christ most clearly in Daniel 2 is in Nebuchadnezzar's dream in two elements. First, the stone, and then second, the kingdom that God's going to establish. The stone that crushes the world powers and the kingdom that God establishes both come in the person of Jesus Christ. 
He is the stone and he establishes the kingdom. In Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the stone comes, it strikes the metallic elements, crushing them to the ground. This stone is Jesus the Messiah. Listen to what Peter in the New Testament says in a great sermon in, in Acts chapter 4 verse 11. Listen to what Peter says. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. Jesus also referenced himself as the stone in Luke chapter 20 verse 18 when he says of himself, this is remarkable, listen, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. This is Jesus saying it about himself. We're going to get into this way more in the coming chapters, but the stone that Nebuchadnezzar sees in his dream is the person of Jesus Christ coming into history. The second reference we see in Jesus in Daniel 2 is the kingdom that God establishes in his dream. Remember, the stone represents the kingdom he's going to establish. It's a symbol, it's an image there. And is there a more prevalent theme in all the New Testament than the kingdom of God? It is everywhere. Listen to the very first words of Jesus in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. This is the very first words of Jesus when he's stepping into his public ministry. He says, quote, Mark 1, 15, the time is fulfilled. What time? And the kingdom of God is at hand. What kingdom? The kingdom of God that the stone's rolling in. And then as he lives his ministry out, Matthew 13, 31, over and over again, Jesus compares the kingdom. In this particular instance, he compares the kingdom of God to a mustard seed. It starts out really small, but when it's fully grown, it becomes the largest plant there is. It sounds like a growing stone mountain to me. And then Jesus dies and, he, and he's raised to life in the resurrection. And we're told in Acts chapter 1 verse 3 what he says after his resurrection. Acts 1, 3. He presented himself alive to them and speaking about the kingdom of God. Now what would be on the mind of someone being raised from the dead? He could have had all things on his mind, but we see one thing on the mind of Jesus after being raised and it's the kingdom of God. And then his final words in Matthew 28, before he's ascended into heaven, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Sounds like a new kingdom's been put in place. It's not one restricted to earth, and it's one where Christ has authority over all. I, lo I love the way Martin Lloyd-Jones puts it. He says, if you and I are depressed by what's happening in our world today, well, it's because we are not truly Christian in our thinking. This is the story of the Bible and of history. These great powers arise against God and everyone believes that they're going to be triumphant. But suddenly God arises. He just humbles them and puts them in their place and goes on with his wonderful purpose, end quote. All kingdoms of the world have a lifespan. None of them rule forever. John Piper puts it like this, quote, one day America and all her presidents will simply be a footnote in history. As all the other kingdoms will be. As we look around and we may think, what's going on in our world? I mean, these are disturbing times, disturbing, disturbing events. What is happening? Where is God? Daniel 2 reminds us all the hope we have in God that perception is not always reality. What we see over and over in Daniel is even when things look hopeless and lost, even when it all appears out of control, the fight of the Christian, listen, fight believer to believe this, that God is still reigning, that God is still supreme, that God is in control, and every aspect that happens in our world is happening to accomplish his intended end, no matter what it looks like now. And so how do we respond? I leave you with this, Hebrews 12, 28. This is our response. Hebrews 12, 28. 
Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let's pray. Oh God, you reign above all. You have established your kingdom in the person of Jesus Christ. And no, we don't experience the full effects of it now. We know that one day in his second coming that we will see every knee bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you that things are not out of control, that things are not surprising you in our world right now. Even though things appear out of control at times and things appear very scary, no doubt. Thank you that you are still reigning. And Lord, my prayer for myself first, for this church, give us a, a secure faith, a ballast in our life that says no matter how strong the winds blow, we will trust the God that's in control. Make it true in our hearts. I pray in Christ's name, amen. We're gonna have a time of reflection to think about God's word and his message to us. Church of Jesus Christ, rest securely knowing and reflect in this time that you're living in a kingdom where Jesus Christ rules every day, every day. If you never trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior, you too can enter this kingdom. The way that Jesus is set up for his kingdom to be entered is through repentance and faith. Repenting of your sin and your rebellion and your opposition to God where you have denied him as your king and turning to Jesus Christ in faith, trusting that what he did on the cross, dying, took the punishment for your sin. Three days later when he rose from the dead, gave you eternal life. If you would turn from your sin and trust in him, you too will have a seat in the kingdom. Whatever it is that God is leading you to do, I invite you to do in this moment. And then we're going to stand and sing together.